You have to switch him on. <laughs> well, we have a couple of questions here, just a few. <laughs> but before we answer them, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, you have promised wisdom. And we claim your promise in Jesus' name. Amen. Spirit of prophecy says public prayers should be short. <laughs> That's a good book. All right, so. Many questions here, and uh, I always say there's no such thing as a stupid question, because a question is something that bothers somebody, isn't that so? So there's no such thing as a stupid question, and there's no such thing as a negative question, because a negative question is also a question and often a negative question can elicit a positive response. So whatever you want to ask, don't feel shy. Some people where I've had questions and answers have asked abusive questions. Or let's say, put them in an abusive fashion. That's fine because that's how that person feels at that moment. He's angry or she's angry. And uh, who created the emotion of anger? Was it the devil? No. It's how we deal with it that comes from the devil <laughs> or from God. But there's something called righteous anger or righteous indignation, isn't there? So don't feel shy if you think, well, I'm not going to ask this because I'm feeling obnoxious. Feel obnoxious and ask the question. I was wondering how different civilizations from opposite sides of the planet have similar forms of worship. For instance, major icons, uh, African types, Egyptian, many worship the sun or use snakes as symbols in their architecture. Do you have any inputs on that? The Bible calls false religion Babylon. Babylon. Now, all the ancient pagan religions in the ancient Babylon were actually perfected to the Babylonian worship style. And the Babylonian gods are the symbols of sun worship. And all the religions embodied in that Babylonian worship style are the culmination of everything that Satan threw at the planet. So Egyptian worship style, the ancient Mesopotamian worship styles, the first apostate worship styles, replacing the God, the personal God, with the creation or the created things of the personal God, all culminated in Babylon. And all false religion comes from that source to this very day. All the elements of typical Babylon we will find in anti-typical Babylon. And of course people like to claim that this earth is much older than it is. And they will say, these religions or these peoples lived 10,000 years before Christ, 20,000 years before Christ. They said that about Egypt when I was a kid. We learned that in school, 10,000 BC, 12,000 BC. And then as the science of archaeology started unearthing the truth, what happened to those time periods? They shrunk. So what was in Babylon spread across the world 
and therefore we have a similar worship systems all over the world. The religion of Buddhism, the religion of Hinduism, Buddhism is a sect of Hinduism, the religions that we find all over the world, whether the Aztec religions, they all have the same symbolism because they come from the same source, and those people were not as ancient as some would like us to believe, but far younger. And that's why they're all in the same place all over the world. Walter, you like to say, wow. Don't you know about it? It's an occult word, and wow stands for 666. <laughs> and more. Well, thank you for the information. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of a homophone? <laughs> Is that right, Francie? Homophone? A homophone? Yeah. yeah. A homophone is one word, more one than so one meaning. One sound. One sound, more than one meaning. Now, if you use, for example, oh, use the word wow. <laughs> I don't have an intention to shout 666 when I say the word wow. So, it's a homophone, and excuse me if I have offended you with the word. I'll try to use it backwards next time. Second century temple veil that was torn from top to bottom. I think it is the word first. What is the. Is it first, Francie, or the second? Must be the se first. Or the second century temple veil that was torn from top to bottom. It was the veil that separated the holy from the most holy. Francie, tell them about the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, even today, why they won't walk on the Temple Mount? Well, they feel this is such a holy place, they will not walk there until the Temple has been built. They go even further. Some of them might inadvertently stand on the most holy place and die. But when that Temple curtain tore from top to bottom, then the old ritual, the old typology came to an end. And the door of petition was torn. And they could look into the Most Holy and also their sacrificial system typologically was ended. In the Spirit of Prophecy we read that the high priest when he tried to kill the Passover lamb, it escaped from his hands. Now, it doesn't stand in the Bible, but it is not in disharmony with the Bible. So that typological dispensation came to an end, and the sacrificial system ended. There are some more questions, I think, dealing, I'll glance through them quickly just now, dealing with that issue, so we'll come back to it. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Old or New Testament? <laughs> now you read it. All scripture is given by of God and these for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness. Now the question says, why is the translation not in harmony with what Paul says? And 
I must say I struggle with the question because I don't find any disharmony between the text and what Paul says. All scripture is God breathed. He uses the human instrument. He doesn't bypass the human instrument. It's not dictated. We use our minds and so God honors that and even in a prophet he gives a vision the spirit directs but the prophet puts it in his own words so it is given even though the prophet wrote it in his own words it was by inspiration from God so I don't think there's any disharmony do you? no, no. okay huh now, there's the 144,000. And then where are the rest of the SDAs? <laughs> On a serious note, I was in Ethiopia just at the end of last year. And I came across 7,000 people. Most of them had been, been ostracized because they believed the spirit of prophecy and tried to implement its principles. That's sad, eh? And in the middle of nowhere in that jungle, I was evangelizing, and it's not a third world country. I can't even say a fifth world country. It's like being transported way past the Middle Ages. And yet those people knew what was on the internet. They knew all the, the nuances of Adventist theology and counter-theology. And they were on fire for God. So when I left there, I said to them, I now, I now have a big problem. Because the Bible says there are 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, and all of them are in Ethiopia. <laughs> so I'm sorry, guys, but you're going to lose out. Well, the 144,000, there are some who say it is literal. But then we have a problem with uh, some of the tribes that were mentioned and there's the tribe of Dan and there certainly were heroes in the tribe of Dan which are mentioned in the Bible and therefore this number being the multiplication of the twelves must be symbolic but for those who wanted a literal number if we continue as we continue in the Seventh-day Adventist Church maybe it'll be literal in the end so We also have a little bit of counsel which says, do not go beyond what is written. And we also have counsel which says, on these issues where there is no clear-cut answer, don't make a theology out of it that can become divisive. If you have a particular view and you feel very strong about it, but there is no clear-cut evidence that it's not like this or not like the other way, then keep it out of the realms of argument in terms of defining who they are and who they not are. Pray that you are part of them or that you stand with them. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses also have a crisis because when they reached that number, they had to change their theology, right? <laughs> we want to hear again how you got introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's such a long story. Can we do it at a later stage, perhaps? From the evidence we have, does Ron Wyatt's discoveries of Noah's Ark look to be true? Can you expand on the evidence for or against? 
Well, Francie and I went to Armenia, and I'm going to let him speak. But before I continue with this question, Ron Wyatt doesn't only claim to have found the Ark, what else did he find? He also found the Ark of the Covenant. What else did he find? The path through the Red Sea. What else did he find? It's the real Sinai. So there are many claims that he has made. And he's no longer with it, and I don't want to speak ill. But we have to be very, very circumspect before we run after every wind of doctrine and discovery. Now I'll just talk about one before I give Francois the Ark. And that is the Ark of the Covenant. He claims that he crawled under one of, into one of those tunnels which are everywhere in uh, Jerusalem. And that he found under Golgotha, the Ark of the Covenant, and when the blood of Christ dripped from the cross, during the earthquake, the earth split open and drops fell onto the Ark of the Covenant. Then he took some of those drops and he had them analyzed and there was no Y chromosome. So he didn't have an earthly father was the conclusion. And then they'll show you the lab reports of what happened. Now, I have serious problems with that. I have biological problems, I have theological problems, and let's just talk about them. He was made altogether such as we are. That means he had a Y chromosome. And he was a male, right? Because according to the scripture, he was circumcised on the eighth day. So he must have had a Y chromosome, otherwise uh, how was he circumcised? God could have kept the blood there miraculously for 2,000 years. I mean, we find Tyrannosaurus Rex blood intact today. So let's give him that. But now look at the typology. The death on the cross. What was the typical feast which it represented? It was the Passover. Question, was the blood of the Passover lamb ever sprinkled onto the Ark of the Covenant? No. So God wouldn't violate his own typology to satisfy Ron Wyatt. So I'm afraid I have to reject that theology on a biological level and on a typological level. That brings us to the Ark. Francie, what do you say? Uh, this man is an embarrassment for this church. No, not Me. him. <laughs> we check every statement, and not one is correct. Loretta and myself went to uh, Ararat, and we look at the f geological f structure of a ship, but there's nothing. And... Uh, I've been to Israel about 40 times. I managed two times to get onto Calvary, Gordon's Calvary. It's a cemetery. And I was chucked out by the guide. I was so innocent, I just wanted to take a few, few pictures, Walter. He's been thrown out many times. We went to the Vatican, and you're not supposed to take pictures. But uh, the Bible says you must obey God more than man. I'm just justifying myself. <laughs> and he said, evangelize. And for, to do that, I need some pictures. So I was... <whistles> but it's so dark in there, you have to use the flash. <laughs> in those days. Today, you've got nice digital cameras. You can get away without a flash and enhance it on your computer, but not in those days. Now, he was with me. I'm standing there, and I'm... 
And you hear the guard shouting, you keep silent for the next five minutes, and then you see the next one, you go, and eventually they think it's over there, because there are lots of people, which one was it now? And the guards came roaring up to us, and they pointed at me, I was the culprit, and I pointed at him. <laughs> So they picked him up and they carried him out. <laughs> which gave me the opportunity to take three more pictures. <laughs> now you think, that's bad, I did the same to my wife. <laughs> but not in the Vatican, this was in a Jesuit temple. And they physically threw her out and I didn't go to save her because I got another three pictures. So carry on, you were at the ark. <laughs> so please forget about Ron Wyatt. Not one of his statements can be proved. At sensation from start to finish, some of us talked to the man and said, you know this is not the truth, but he just very stubborn, like some of us, and he went ahead. So ignore it, it's sensational, it's not scientific. That's all I want to say, Walter. Well, one more point. I spoke to some of his personal followers who actually waited in the desert for him to reveal what he had said, what he would be next. I'm not going to go there. They waited in vain. They waited in vain. Stick to the facts. Uh, I am saddened by this discovery, but I must ask, how do we reconcile having a church representative liaison to an organization, the UN, whose claim is to eradicate Jesus Christ from the minds of men? Is there merit to claim that our observer status keeps us distinct as the people of God, or are we repeating the sins of ancient Israel? I have a new series out, it's called Total Transformation. And in that series I address the typological and the antitypical Israel. Ancient Israel and the final movement as represented in this church. The parallels are striking. And it is spirit of prophecy based. The spirit of prophecy says we are repeating the history of ancient Israel. She goes further and says we are worse than they are. We had time to perfect it. So we, yes, we are worse. The reason why I did that series, because there will be many that will be very angry with me because of that series, because I mentioned by name what we do. I even mentioned by name what organizations we are affiliated with. But my reason is different to those who sit outside the church and have nothing better to do than to criticize this church. I have a responsibility, I'm an evangelist. And people say to me, how can I join this church when you do exactly the same things as the church you're asking me to leave. Isn't that a good point? So I have a responsibility to show them that in spite of the fact that we do exactly what the other churches do, yes, we sit in ecumenical councils. Yes, we have representations at bodies where we shouldn't be. Yes, we've had conference presidents and uh, other presidents ch sign the Charta Ecumenica which recognizes papal succession and which says that we will preach and teach nothing to affect that ecumenical harmony. Yes, we've had that. But there's a huge difference between this church and any other church that does that. All the other churches have a top-down structure. The ultimate top-down structure is the papacy. If the Pope decides that one person, the whole church, 
is obligated to believe it. In the other churches, you have synods. If the synod gets together, however large that body, according to the size of the church, if that body decides it, the church has to believe it, it becomes doctrine. Not the SDA church. How does it work here? You decide. God has made this church different. He has called it out of Babylon, and he has given it the final message. We are repeating the history of Israel, yes, but if it weren't for the fact that the individuals within the churches choose the delegates who choose the delegates who choose the conference presidents who choose the unions who choose the GC and even with all those powers in place can all of these change one doctrine in this church yes or no no what does it take it takes a GC session and who attends the GC session you do the representatives of the church and God in his wisdom has seen to it that there are more third world people that are Seventh-day Adventists than first world people that are Seventh-day Adventists because if you live in a first world country and you have the privileges of a first world country very often you don't have the need for God as someone who lives in a third world country. And so third world countries tend to be conservative in their thinking. Freaks the first world countries out. And when it comes to the vote, it's that vote which swings. And sometimes that vote doesn't sit comfortably with first world countries, but they're bound to it. They squirm and they, man, and they do this. And sometimes they decide, we don't care. Those people are primitive. We're going to go it alone. And then you have a president here or a membership there or whatever, and they do their own thing and they say, well, I don't care. I'm going to sign this charter ecumenica. Does that make my church apostate? No, but it makes him apostate or her apostate. So there's a difference between our church and other churches. Yes, we have many apostate people in this church, but there are 7,000 all living in Ethiopia who have not bent the knee to bow. Does God know the decisions that we are going to make? If so, then wouldn't that mean predestination is true and Presbyterian Calvinist doctrine is correct? What is the proper order of how to deal with false teachers who corrupt the church and the youth and all they desire to do is debate. What are we to do when the board, the elders and the deacons are not given the proper attention to the issues going on in the church? Are we to, to transfer membership? Are we to stay and minister individually? What do we do when leadership does nothing about the problems? This echoes the problems in the church. This is what's happening. Does God know? Francie, does he know everything? Foreknowledge and predestination are two different things. Oh. Predestination does not allow you to make a choice. Ah, but foreknowledge does. Yeah. I have a friend in South Africa, and he married a girl who is dying. A young girl who is dying. And she said to him, I cannot marry you, I'll destroy your life. I'm dying. He said to her, I want to marry you anyway, because I love you. Why would you want to rob me of one year of happiness with you? Marry me. So she married him. Did he have foreknowledge that she's going to die? Did he do it anyway? Yes. So God has foreknowledge, but he doesn't hold the foreknowledge against us. 
Did he have knowledge that Saul was going to become an apostate? Sure. Why did he choose him? He gives a reason. He was the humblest. But as in many cases, when power comes to humility, is added to humility, humility flies out the window. So God didn't hold his foreknowledge against Saul. And so God is not a God of predestination, even though he is a God of foreknowledge. Did God know that Jones and Wagner might not stay the course? Did that prevent him from using them mightily? No. So pray that we all stay the course. Anything else? And what do you do with all the false teachers who corrupt the church? You weep between the porch and the altar for all the evil that is done in Israel. Do I leave the church because the church is corrupt? And who's going to call those that could still be saved to repentance if everybody is going to leave? I say, buy yourself a pot of glue. Strong glue. <laughs> Fix it to your posterior and sit in the chair. <laughs> I get invited to camp meetings which are more like rock concerts than camp meetings. Where's my Bible, Francie? They play heavy metal, I sit and I read my Bible. I'm sweating like crazy, but I know show nobody. I read my Bible. Then they sing a hymn, and I stand up. I will sing. They sing rock music. I sit down and read my Bible. Do you think people notice? I don't have to say anything. So how to deal with them? But public sins must be publicly addressed. I cannot keep quiet in the face of open public sin because thereby, what do I do? Condone it. Thank you, Francie. I condone it. I cannot condone sin. But if I have said my say, enough. Enough. I don't know whether that answers the question. Are you satisfied? Does the Greek word used mean mansion or room? Francie, one should never make a little sarcastic interluding <laughs> comment during a sermon. Did you know that? Except when it comes to the Tectus Receptus and what? the NIV. You may do a little sarcasm. I may. Because Elijah also did it. Elijah used sarcasm, Francie, I'm sure. And never... I, Isaiah did the same. Isaiah did the same? Yeah. Tell, tell them, we were just in Jordan. Ha, got it right. And we went to a church, and there was a mosaic on the floor. Please tell them. You know, it's good to stick to the uh, Textus Receptus. I showed Walter a place mentioned in the Bible used by the Textus Receptus on this St. George's mosaic. And it gives the exact spot where this place is. Use both translations, but believe the Textus Receptus. What does the one say and what does the other one say? The one say Betabara, the other one says Bethany. So in the NIV it would say they baptized, John the Baptist be baptized at Bethany. And uh, the Textus Receptus will say Betabara. Betabara. And you can read it and there. And the inscription that is how old, Francis? At six, six, 600 AD. And what does it say? Betabara. Thank 
you. The crossing. All right. The room, the word used there is monet. And it means literally a staying. A staying or translated a residence. Uh, also by implication a mansion. Now, you could argue that a room is also a staying, a residence, somewhere where you stay. So, it wouldn't technically be incorrect to say a room. It would be technically incorrect to use the TNIV translation, which means plenty of space, plenty of room because that's not a staying, that's not a residence. But a, a residence, does it mean one room or does it imply more than one room? So make up your own mind whether you want to live in a room or in something a little bit more spacious. <laughs> Was Satan back and forth to heaven after he was kicked out from there? How do you explain Revelation 12, 7 to 9 and Job 1, 6 to 12? Satan was kicked out of heaven. But then he duped Adam and Eve and he became the ruler of this planet. And in the council of heaven, when God called his council together, we read in the book of Job that God called such a council together, and it says, and among them was Satan. Now the reason why he was there, because he was representing this earth. He claimed it as his, and he had the audacity to attend these councils. And God permitted him to stay in these councils. Until when? Until he was no longer the representative of this planet. Because a price was paid to rip it from him. And that happened at the cross. Christ became the representative of this planet. And he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Woe to you, because the devil has gone down to you. By the way, how do you spell that word woe? <laughs> woe. <laughs> I'm very naughty, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. A prince, which would then agree with Daniel 9.26, where it says that a prince will come and destroy the city. Francie, you're doing Daniel. Tell them about that beautiful chiastic structure, the prince and the messiah, the one representing... Well, well you do it. Carry on, carry on. Yeah, the chiastic structure. Yeah, it's a chiasm, and it compares the Messiah with the prince that will come and destroy Jerusalem. So, it's Rome versus the literal Messiah. It's very unfortunate that dispensationalist theology throws the final week into the future with no biblical text whatsoever to warrant it, and therefore turns the Messiah into the Antichrist. Dangerous stuff. So the prince that will come to destroy the city is Rome. Question for Walter. I've seen presentations on people, mostly prominent worldly preachers, who throw up the devil's sign, and I've seen you point like this as well, with your index and pinky both up. Francie, I've noticed you do that too sometimes. 
the secret is out. <laughs> Might it be true that some people simply just point like that? Never make signs the basis for your theology. But when they publish signal pictures, that's a totally different kettle of fish. Because they have their own photographers and they shoot rapid fire and they choose one particular one and it's always the same crowd of photographers, inside photographers, and that picture is chosen and put into a publication with a particular message involved. So there's a difference. And uh, if you're going to find one picture taken by Joe Blow and put into his whatever homepage, that does not necessarily mean that that is occult. If you stand long enough, you'll probably find every single signal under the book. But if someone says, for example, uh, we worship. Now somebody could have taken that picture, right? I would be dead meat, right? <laughs> and does these signs in a very deliberate fashion or keeps them constant while saying something, that's totally different to just a normal hand gesture. Don't make hand gestures or symbols your theology. It's just interesting information. And in any case, when they find out that the people are wise to them, they change their hand gesture. So, don't get involved too much in that. And uh, if I have done it inadvertently, well, then I apologize. And if you are confused, then compare my theology with the hand signal. And if there's a match, then kick me out. Whew. How does the Vatican control Islam? <laughs> I have a lecture on that. Yes, it's called the Islamic Connection. I've had uh, riots around my lectures with imams walking into my lectures. I had one in South Africa with imams rioting outside my lectures and then walking in with a big parade during the lecture, handing it over to me personally. And uh, I said, welcome, come and sit down, the front seats are open. And they actually stayed for my lecture. And uh, when was the beast power formed? Five thirty eight AD until seventeen ninety eight. When was the little horn's deadly wound healed? When did it start to be healed? Nineteen twenty nine. When Mussolini gave them back their political status, right? Status. And once you have political status, you again qualify as a horn. The Bible says he controlled everything from 538 to 1798. And he was the Antichrist power. And all the reformers said so. Was there one exception? No. You know, if I read some of our modern publications that come out of our stable. I like to go to the explanation of the little horn. And if it's so vague that you don't even know whether it's the cleaner or the Iman Mahdi, then you can know that we've lost our compass direction. But in any case, the Bible says this power 
is the Antichrist power. We had theologians recently screaming, no, Islam is the Antichrist power. Theologians in our own ranks. And there are theologians today who say that the two religions are basically the same. How can the one God have a son and the other one not have the son and still be the same God? It's a bit of a problem, right? How can the one say atonement is the way to salvation and the other one say there was no atonement? How can the one say God's son died for you and the other one say God's son never died and he doesn't have a son? It's an insult to say he had a son. And Jesus wasn't his son. He was taken away before he saw death. So the two are not one. The one is an open antagonist against Christianity and the other one is a clandestine opponent to Christianity. The one has a garb of Christianity and the other one stands as an open opponent to Christianity. Even the Lutheran theologians said to the Jesuits, you Jesuits claim that the Pope is not the Antichrist, but that Islam is the Antichrist. How can you say Islam is the Antichrist when it opposes God openly and doesn't sit in the temple of God claiming to be God? Now just think for yourselves. If the one is an open opponent and the other one is a clandestine, secret opponent, and the one was there before the other, haven't they got the same agenda? The destruction of Christianity, yes or no? Where do we find Islam today? All the places where the early Sabbath-keeping Christians were, those who believed the Bible and the Bible alone. Isn't that fascinating? Only for a brief little period did Islam infiltrate into the papal realm, into the southern part of Spain. But there were two groups in Spain. One that was totally subject to the Pope and the other one opposed to papal power and control. And which one received the lashing? And why did the papal legate march in front of the Islamic army when they entered into Spain if he wasn't happy to see them? And so I've had many discussions with people and I've spoken to three imams that became Seventh-day Adventists. And they are fully aware of the secret liaison. You travel the Middle East, Francie. Come on. <clears throat> what did we see there? Tell them. A Catholic church next to the the mosque, that huge mosque yeah. of Dali, I think. Yeah, right next and to each friends. other. They are they no matter where you go, they're standing right next to each other. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a tunnel underneath. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, the other point is, who did Muhammad marry? Khadija. Yes, Khadija. She was a Roman Catholic. And where did she get her funds from? From Roman Catholicism. And why was it that when Muhammad escaped, when his life was threatened, why did he flee to the Catholic prelates to be preserved? Something very similar happened in modern times. There was a terrorist, a terrible terrorist, terrorist numero uno, almost like Obama. <laughs> uh, not Obama, sorry. <laughs> that was a... <laughs> That was a slip of an S, sorry. <laughs> Almost like Osama. That terrorist's name was Yasser Arafat. He was on the terrorist list. He was not yet the accepted leader of the 
Palestine Liberation Army. He was terrorist number one. And there was a time period when his life was threatened by his own organization. And he was whisked to a waiting frigate of France, which had been sent at the bequest of the Pope. And guess who brought Yasser Arafat to the frigate? Because it was just outside. Where would, did we land with the aeroplane? Lot. And Lot, the capital city, not the capital city, but the city where we landed in Jerusalem, not Jerusalem, in Israel. Where the aeroplane landed. Where the Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. I have to keep him awake. I'm at the Wailing Wall, Walter. He's at the Wailing Wall. <laughs> Tel Aviv. So Israel brought him to the ship. Now, if he was terrorist number one and they'd been looking for him so long, why didn't they just keep him? And he went into exile and he stayed there. And he's Islam. But he kisses the ring of the Pope. And when the pressure was over and that crisis had been resolved, he was returned with great pomp to carry on being terrorist number one until he became the leader of the Palestinian state. Now, look, conspiracy or no conspiracy, that's just conspiracy fact. Right? I'm not saying any more than what happened historically and what you can read anywhere. That's just the facts. And if you can draw a conclusion from that, who's really working together and who not, then do so. But watch that video. What is it with the double beard and the split beard that we see in the paintings of Jesus in so much artwork in SDA publications also? Well, the split beard is used in the occult as a symbol of the knowledge of good and evil. So it is an occult symbol. Many of the paintings we have come from organizations that are apparent Christians. <laughs> a lot of it comes from Mormonism. But... Uh, Brigham Young said the devil told the truth about Godhood. I would not have Mother Eve miseating the forbidden fruit for anything because through the gift of sin man can achieve Godhood. I was strolling with some of our leaders through Mormon territory and the little girl was telling what her favorite text was in the Book of Mormon. And she said her favorite text was, Adam sinned so that man could have joy. So I nudged one of the leading men and I said, eh, did you hear that? But I got no response, so I left it. And then there is something called ignorance. And we take these things and we don't really see them or don't really know. And by the way, is it wrong to have a picture? It says to bow down to them and to worship them. And Jesus was fully man, wasn't he? And there's nothing wrong with a picture of my mother or my grandmother, right? So inherently there's nothing wrong with the picture of Jesus. But if it becomes an object of my worship and my meditation, then it surely is a problem. So personally, I'm not a fan of all of these pictures. But I'm not going to make a big deal, because to some people it's important. And yes, there are some uh, occult things in some of the pictures. And some of the pictures even have subliminals in them. And uh, a hidden goat's foot, for example, 
or a snake symbol in the hair. And, uh, you know, I can become so hung up on symbols that I forget the God of heaven and earth. So don't make symbolism your religion and run after every symbol and find the devil behind every bush. But uh, don't uh, necessarily become a lover of these things either and incorporate them in your life. I was wondering, Walter, if we could have a song just for a little break. Okay. Where's the song leader? Pastor Bob. <laughs> Pastor Bob is not with lead us. us. Lead us in a little song just to, to stand up, get new energy and new questions. What shall we sing, Francis? A cappella. Up for a moment. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, that sounded good. Perfect. Salvation. Thank you. We're going to be here for a long time. Francie, you better think of a few more tunes. Please comment on John 20, 22 and 23. Hold the New Testament. <laughs> you asked that before. <laughs> The disciples could forgive sins. So these must, this is the text, I think, which says that God, Jesus said, uh, the sins you forgive will be forgiven and those that you will. Read them to us. 20. 20, 22, and 23. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Why don't you read them? Uh, Luke 5. Is it verse 21? What does it say? Luke 5, 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So we have some parallel texts, some interesting parallel texts. In what sense were the disciples empowered to forgive or not forgive sins? This must have something. You, God, is the only one who can forgive sins. And many sins are just personally confessed to God directly. So this must deal with public sins, which the church has the duty, not only the power, to rebuke until addressed and corrected. So this has nothing to do with the personal forgiveness of individual sins. Would you agree? Yeah. Also interesting, 
The Textus Receptus says, confess your faults one to another. And the Greek word there is different to the word sins. The new translation says, forgive your, uh, confess your sins one to another. And this is the beauty of the spirit of prophecy. Now you take the spirit of prophecy and you read it and she says, confess your faults one to another. Sins should be confessed to God alone. So the new translation, judging by the spirit of prophecy, is wrong. So some people will say, but you cannot use Ellen G. White for exegesis. If the prophet doesn't know what the verse says, then who does? Right? Now, faults are totally different. I go to my brethren and say, you know, I have such a short fuse. Can you pray for me? Or I have a weakness in this or that and the other. Can you pray for me? That's confessing your faults one to another. But the details of your personal sins, they belong to God. Because if I go to someone and I say, you know, whenever I see that girl, I have such a terrible desire for her. The next day he sees me in church, what's going through his mind? Or what if he sees me sitting next to her, what's going through his mind? He will pay no attention to what's going on in the sermon. It's got nothing to do with him. It has to do with, between me and God. I have to say to God, Lord, I have thoughts here in my mind that I do not want. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord. Purge me with his hop. Take this away. That's my battle where only God can help me. How can one distinguish between God's chastening and Satan's attacks on our lives? Francis, you are much older than I. You have more experience in this than I have. <laughs> Read the book of Job. Read the book of Job. Yeah. But Job had such nice friends. <laughs> Do you have friends like Job? I've only got one friend. He's very hard on me. <laughs> I will not mention his name. <laughs> <laughs> when my wife ran out to go and tell my daughter at six o'clock in the morning that she must please not drive before we pray, she fell over a bundle of sticks got flung into the air, broke her leg, broke her hip. Long story. Finally they had to replace the hip. They didn't have enough bone. They took out the top of the femur, put it in formaldehyde, and then they discovered they didn't have enough bone, so she stayed on the operating table for 12 hours, waiting for bone to come from another hospital. And they planted that in. And they tested that bone for osteoporosis. There was none. No osteoporosis. Bad things happen to people. My friend always says, every good deed will be punished. Thank you. Every good deed will be punished. She ran out to pray. And after that event, the telephone didn't stop ringing. What sin did you commit in order to elicit such a punishment? It's fascinating. We have good friends, Job's friends, in this world. Was that chastening or this event from God or was it from the devil? When that tower fell in Jerusalem and all those people died, and the people asked, who sinned? Was it uh, their parents or was it them? What did Jesus say? Neither of them. 
Neither of them. And you know, you struggle with it and you say, Lord, why, why this? It's such a break. It's such a go slow on this evangelism. What do we do? And you struggle with it. Everybody struggles with it. Until you come to the conclusion it's the wrong question. Why not you? Why must it always be someone else? Why not you? I'll tell you a little story. Maybe my wife should tell it herself, but I'll tell it for her. She's a little bit shy. You want to tell it? No. Anyway. Yes. I want her to tell it. They yes. say the two shall be one. <laughs> she was struggling with it. Because it's still not healed and they think the screws are loose and maybe the whole operation must be done all over again. So it's a mess. She's here with the crutch and trying to be brave. I like her. And she was struggling with it, struggling with it and saying, God, why, why did you permit this in our lives right now? Why doesn't it go away? And why, you know, other people get hip replacements and, and they work, but this one is not working. Why? Do you still care if I've done something wrong? We do struggle like that, don't we? And then just a, just a few weeks ago, we had to rush somewhere because I had to do some baptisms or something. I can't remember. And we forgot most of the things. You know, we always forget everything. And it was just before Sabbath. And you know, women, they never have anything to wear. I don't understand it, but... <laughs> do you have that problem? Every single Sabbath. Which one must I wear? This one or that one? I don't even look. I said that one. Because I know she'll wear the other one. Do you have that problem? All the time? Yeah. I don't know. It's just part of their mindset. So get used to it. She says to me, if you wanted to marry a man, marry a man. I'm a woman. So get used to it. But she didn't have anything to wear. And she didn't want to spend a lot of money. So she said, can we go to the mall? And she was hobbling with her crutch. And we went, she went from store to store. And uh, how long ago was this? Two months? Two months ago. And she looked into the store and there was no sale. She wanted something on sale. Just something quickly off the rack. No sale. She went to the next store, looked through the stuff, there was nothing to find. Is, have you also found that? They never find anything. <laughs> and then she went to another store, a big store, and she looked inside and there was no sale. And she didn't want to go inside. And she had a distinct impression, not a voice, but a distinct impression, go inside. And she resisted their impression and said, but there's, there's no sale, I don't want to go inside. And then she had a distinct impression, go inside. And she took a step forward. She listened to the impression. And the next second, the huge sign of that building in that huge metal frame came crashing down right behind her. And the guard who was standing at the door said, oh, Madam, you could have been killed. And guess what? She was overjoyed. Why? Because she had all these doubts. Does God still care? And hearing this little thing, he proved to her, I still care. I still want to use you. You still have to keep that husband of yours in check. <laughs> so I don't know, is the chastening from God or is it from the devil? From whoever it comes, God permitted it. And if he permitted it, then he'll carry you through it. As you have proven the title of Diana was given to Mary, the Catholic Church teaches her son was born on the 25th of December. That makes Jesus the name of Tammuz in English, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, 
They have no J. Where did the name come from? Okay, here we come to this tricky question of the names. Francie, am I really very long-winded when it comes to these things? You are so interesting, Walter. Carry on. Do you want to answer it? No. All right, let's start. (laughs) This is potluck. You saw I just got all these questions, right? It's, It's difficult to deal with them off the bat like this, but let's try. In what language was the New Testament written? Greek. How do we know it wasn't written in Hebrew? The internal evidence tells us it was written in Greek because whenever a Hebrew word or an Aramaic word is used, it's always translated immediately into the Greek. That means it must have been written in Greek for a Greek audience. So when it uses the word Messiah, it says translated the Christ. If you take the name of Peter, It says, Kephas. What language is that? That's Aramaic. It says, translated, Petros. Little pebble, little rock. Not Petra, the rock. Am I right? Not Greek, right? But here's a man who knows Greek. So he's just there to check on me. He told me this just the other day anyway. (laughs) He's an oracle. If you don't know, phone him. So I could digress there about Peter the Rock. He's not. He's Petros. Who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. On this rock, on this statement, I will build my church. Got nothing to do with Peter. I digress. Let's get back to the point. So if it was permissible to use a Greek word in place of a Hebrew word, even when it comes to the word Messiah, Christ, is it then permissible to change the name. Paul used the name Jesus Christos even in the letter to the Hebrews. He didn't write Yeshua, Messiah. He wrote Jesus Christos. That's Greek. So it's permissible to translate the name of Jesus Christ into another language. Now, if I want to translate it into English, is it permissible to write Jesus Christ? Now, as the person rightly points out, the letter J did not exist until a few centuries ago, so it would have been Jesus Christ. But then there came a problem with the J and the Y in the English language. Because you can say... June, or you could say for the same letter, Yun. And to make the difference, they use the Y and the J. So you would say, you wouldn't say J, you'd say Y. So they use the Y. And for June, they'd use the J. So they added the letter to improve the phonetics of the language. Now, if the pronunciation was Jesus, is it permissible to use the J then, yes or no? Yes, it's just an advance of the language. It's got nothing to do with paganism. And in any case, some people say the word Jesus is too close to Isis. There's a big difference between Isis and Jesus. The one is female and the other one's a male. Right? The one is the son of God and the other one is a pagan deity. 
So I wouldn't say that we should go along with salvation by pronunciation. <laughs> Who do I worship? When I say, in the name of Jesus, I'm using English, and the one I am addressing is the one who died for me, who is the creator, and who is the lawgiver. And by that I distinguish him from any other pagan deity on the planet. So you don't have to, do you have to use the Hebrew name? No. If you're speaking English, you use the English name. Is it permissible to say the Gospel of John? But if you're speaking Afrikaans, you must say the Evangelie van Johannes. If you're speaking German, you have to say das Evangelium Johannes. Right? Are the two the same? Yes, the one's just a different language from the other. I always use the example when I went to Poland for the first time, they were advertising my talks on a banner, and it said Professore Volterra Feitsky. And I asked, is that me? <laughs> and they said, yes. Is there anything wrong with it? No, it's just Polish. Get used to it. All right. What do you think about TV organized religion? Thank you. It says there, thank you. Depends what TV organized religion. Because you can have uh, experiential based religion on television, isn't that so? Where the experience becomes the norm and not the word becomes the norm. And today we have so many television channels with so many different kinds of religious celebrations on it that it boggles the mind. Now, as I said before, in the old days, I used to sit there and I used to mock. And I used to watch all these people fall over and get their <coughs> physical jerks, and I'd think, this, this is ludicrous. And you know that my, many people think like that? And so, I'm not too perturbed about being on te them being on television, as long as the truth is also on television somewhere. And people can switch from one to the other and say, now hang on a second, this starts making cognitive sense because Paul says, when you sing, you must sing with your mind as well. And when you preach, you must preach with your mind. You must understand what's going on. And so one makes sense and one looks like total chaos. And the more chaotic ones we get, the better we'll look. So, anything you want to add? You're doing very well, Walter. Carry on. <laughs> He's very shy. We're going to sing another. I'm out of songs. Another song. Good. But we're getting a little restless. No? You had them put the glue on their posteriors, and they've been glued to their seats for a long time. I said Get the pianist. If we, if we took a little break... And then come back, can we do yeah. some more? You want to do that? Because I don't, just a short break? Okay, let's take a break. But she's there for a song. She's there for a Blessed song. Blessed assurance. Come for a song. We just sang that one. Sing it for us. Blessed assurance again. Yeah. Then we'll take a break. Stand up. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. 
Let's take a, about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and you can put the glue back on and then we'll finish some of the questions then, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>